Deborah Sampson craved adventure. She craved adventure the way hungry man wants food. But it seemed very unlikely. She was born in 1760 in the colony of Massachusetts. She was poor and she was a girl. It seemed very unlikely that she'd have adventures in her lifetime. But her father had gone off to seek fortune, to seek adventure. He'd gone by a ship. The ship had gone down. All hands were lost. So when Deborah was five years of age, her mother was left with five children to feed. And she didn't know how she was going to do it. So at the age of five, Deborah was sent to live with a maiden aunt, Cousin Phyllis, who was her mother's cousin. The, uh, all the children were farmed out. Deborah had to leave her brothers and sisters behind and lived with just Cousin Fuller. But Cousin Fuller, who had never married, loved Deborah. Loved her like the daughter she'd never had. She taught her all the things that girls were supposed to learn in those days. She would learn how to cook and sew, to spin and weave. Cousin Fuller also taught her not so womanly skills like reading and writing. Oh, back in those days, girls weren't expected to learn how to read and write. Those were for the men. In fact, they were so worried about girls studying, they were afraid if they studied too hard, they might get brain fever. <laughs> Pish posh, said Cousin Fuller, and she taught Deborah how to read and write. Deborah loved reading. She loved reading of adventures. She loved the books that were in her cousin's home. After three years, this happy time in Deborah's life passed. Her cousin died. Deborah still couldn't go back and live with her cousin. She still couldn't afford to take her back. And so at the age of eight, Deborah became an indentured servant. She had to work just to have a place to sleep, food to eat. First, she was sent to an old woman, persnickety 80-year-old woman. She had to cook and sew, feed the fire, make sure things were cleaned up. At the end of the day, she could go read books in her home. And she loved those books, stories of adventure. And in particular, she loved to read about New York, Philadelphia, Boston. Wouldn't it be a wonderful adventure to be able to go to one of those exciting places? After two years, the persnickety old woman was taken into relative homes. She could no longer live alone. Deborah was 10. She needed a new home. So she became a servant bound to the Deacon Thomas family. The Thomas family lived on a farm there in Massachusetts. There were five children all of the boys, but there were children. She hadn't lived with children for five years, not since she was five years old, and she had boys that she could play with. So when the chores were done, and there were a lot of chores on the farm, she could milk a cow, harness a horse, plow the fields, as well as help out in the house. When the chores were done, there were children she could play with. When it was school time, Deborah waved goodbye to the Thomas boys. They got to go off to school, but she was a girl. And Deacon Thomas, though he was a good man, he didn't think girls needed schooling. And besides, somebody had to do the chores. So Deborah waved goodbye to the Thomas boys, and she stayed home. When the Thomas boys got home, she'd say, what did you learn at school? School? Who wants to talk about school? Let's go play. So Deborah played with the boys like they were her brothers. But at night... She'd borrow their textbooks and she'd read. She was self-taught, learned everything she could from their books. She was born in 1760. Being in Massachusetts in that part of the 1700s, you cannot help but be smack dab in the middle of history. And so it was for Deborah. When she was 13 years old in 1773, she heard the bells pealing out in town she heard the news. That's how you heard that there was news when the bells would peel out. The news was Sons of Liberty had dressed up like the American Indians, had gone down to the Bay of Boston and poured out all the English tea into the sea. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. The Thomas family laughed, Deborah laughed. They were patriots, all of them. 
People all over Massachusetts were laughing. In fact, ooh, in fact, there was a popular song of the day, and it went like this. There was an old lady lived over the sea, and she was an island queen. Her daughter lived off in a new country with an ocean of water between. Old lady's pockets were full of gold, but never contented was she. So she called on her daughter to pay her a tax of three pence a pound on the tea. Of three pence a pound on the tea. Oh, mother, dear mother, the daughter replied, I shan't do the thing that you ask. I'm willing to pay a fair price for the tea, but never the three penny tax. Shall quote the mother and reddened with rage, for you're my own daughter, you see. And sure, tis quite proper the daughter should pay her mother a tax on the tea. Her mother a tax on the tea. The tea was conveyed to the daughter's door down by the ocean side. The bouncing girl poured out every pound in the dark and boiling tide. And then she called out to the island queen, Oh, mother, dear mother, quoth she, The tea you may have when tis deep enough, But never a tax from me, No, never a tax from me. People all over the colonies were laughing about the Sons of Liberty and the tea in the sea. The king was not amused. The tense situations continued to get more tense, and two years later, the shot rang out that was heard around the world, and America was in revolution. When Deborah heard about that, she was not surprised to hear shortly thereafter the oldest of the Thomas boys had enlisted in the Continental Army. He was like a brother to her. She had grown up with these Thomas boys, and so early the next morning, she climbed a nearby hill. She loved to climb the hills there. She climbed a nearby hill to watch the sunrise, and there she sang another popular song of the day. Here I sit on buttermilk hill. Turn a mill, Johnny has gone for a soul. That was 1775 when America entered the revolution. When Deborah was 18 years old in 1778, she was free from her bounds, no longer bound as an indentured servant and free to go do something. But what? She was still poor. She was still a girl. Her mother wanted her to get married. It was time, she said. But the man that her mother had in mind smelled much too often of the drink. No, thank you. So Deborah decided to become a school teacher. They needed school teachers with so many young men going off to war. Deborah had never set foot in a schoolroom before she was the teacher, and she loved it. But even then, time went by, and she still had that desire to go someplace exciting, someplace like New York, Philadelphia, Boston. If I were a man, she thought, if I were a man, I could go enlist in the Continental Army, and I could go off to one of these exciting places if I were a man. I were a man. And that's how she got the idea. She knew how to spin and weave and sew. So she put her skills together. She spun, she weaved, she took that fabric and turned it into a suit of men's clothing with just enough extra fabric to bind herself so she could be flat chested like a man. Then she practiced. In her boarding room, she practiced walking like a man, 
talking lower like a man, just being a man. She practiced and she practiced and she practiced until she felt ready. And when she was ready, she walked out of her boarding room that night and walked through the night. She walked and she walked. She walked until the sun started coming up and it, as it came up, she could see she was on the outskirts of Boston. Boston, what a perfect place to begin her adventure. She quickly found where they were recruiting soldiers for the Continental Army. The man gave the spiel about all the benefits of being a soldier in the army and Deborah nodded, pretending that she was paying attention. She wasn't paying attention. She was doing cartwheels in her head. They want me, me, to be a soldier. And so when he paused, she picked up that quill pen and wrote, Robert Shurtleff. And that's how she became private, Bobby Shurtleff. She was very, very careful. She never complained. She wanted too badly to be in that army. She had to make sure that she bathed far away from anybody else. And even then she was fully clothed. She worked hard along those. She would march until the shoes would fall off her feet. She could load a gun, shoot a gun, clean a gun. And she worked that, that musket until there were blisters upon blisters upon her hands. And still she didn't complain. Her friends noticed that uh, she was rather peach fast on the face and they said oh you're just a molly bobby she smiled they have no idea <laughs> <laughs> one of deborah's early assignments was to go confiscate food from tories those who were still loyal to the crown they had stolen food from the continental army and they had not been able to eat regularly when away they found where the tories were storing that stolen food they sent a unit there to get the food back. Deborah was among others who were sent into the warehouse to get them. Debbie shimmied inside the window and she saw food, food like she hadn't seen in ever so long. There were sides of beef, cured hams, bacon. And Deborah, being a good soldier, though her mouth was watering, she grabbed that food and passed it out the window where there were others waiting outside to take that food and hurry it off into their stores. Being sure not to be discovered. Even so, <laughs> all of a sudden musket balls were flying and Deborah and the others had to hurry out the window, shitty out the window and run for cover. Deborah ran as fast as she could trying to stay ahead of the musket ball. Going, ah! <laughs> She'd been hit. She'd been hit but she willed herself to not become unconscious. If she lost consciousness, she would lose control of her secret and she did not want that. And though she was throbbing in pain, she willed herself to stay alert. She was taken to a hospital. A doctor came, found that a musket ball had just grazed her forehead, patched her up. Is that everything? Yes, sir. The doctor turned and left. Deborah said nothing. She didn't say, wait a minute, there's another wound. She said nothing. She watched him leave. And when he was gone, she found a metal probe and she began on the wound in her thigh. She did not tell him that she'd been thought shot in the thigh because then he would want her to take her pants off. She would lose control of her secret. And so she said nothing. She took that metal probe and she poked and urged and kept prodding until she could get the musket ball forward. And finally she could get a knife and pop it out of her thigh. She sank back on the bed beads of perspiration on her forehead, but she had dislodged the musket ball. Because Deborah doctored herself that day, she walked with a limp for the rest of her days. 
but a limp isn't enough to keep you out of the army. And so soon enough, Deborah was back in the army, back where she wanted to be. She marched, she fought. She, she soldiered with her unit for a year and a half. At the end of that year and a half, Deborah's unit was sent to Philadelphia. There was another unit, soldiers who were in full riot because they weren't getting paid regularly as so Continental soldiers. Deborah's unit wasn't being paid any more regularly. Still, they were sent to quell the riot. But when they got there, the riot was gone. And Deborah was in Philadelphia. She'd gone to Boston and now she's in Philadelphia. This was working out very nicely. Except for one detail. Yellow fever was also in Philadelphia. And Deborah became deathly ill. She was so sick that she did pass out. What musket ball hadn't done, yellow fever did. She was taken comatose to the hospital. She was so ill that people thought she had died. She was being prepared for burial when her secret was discovered. Perhaps it was that preparation for burial that awakened her. She opened her eyes. Doctor hurried over. Well, young woman, We've got some talking to do. <laughs> she didn't want to talk to the doctor. She wanted to go back and be a soldier, but still, talk they did. Deborah was given an honorable discharge from the army. This time she moved in with an uncle. She lived on his farm, and you can just imagine, before there was radio, before there was television, there was word of mouth. And the news that a woman had been a Continental soldier flew around the countryside. People came from miles around to hear the stories about the woman who had fought as a soldier. And she told her stories to everybody who wanted to hear. There was one young farmer, Benjamin Gannett by name. He loved her stories. He fell in love with the storyteller. He asked her to marry him and she said yes. So she moved from her uncle's farm to Benjamin's farm, and people still kept coming to his farm. The times were tough in this brand new United States of America. And so Deborah got her next idea. If people would come for miles around to hear her tell the stories, they would pay if she went to them. And so it was that Deborah Sampson became one of the first women in the United States of America who went on a paid lecture circuit. <laughs> she went to places like New York, Philadelphia, Boston. That little girl who had craved adventure had adventures and more. 